A Christmas Story Family with Emmanuel Soba. Hi, everybody. It's Diane. I have an expert with us today, Emmanuel Soba. He's the co-founder of A Christmas Story Family. Now, you've already heard about this from Zach Ward and then Yano Anaya. And Yano and Emmanuel came together and they co-founded the whole idea of the family part of A Christmas Story. But there's more to all of these people as you're learning than meets the eye, right? So how did Emmanuel even get here? That's what we're going to talk about. And we're going to learn about the passion of serving people and being part of a community and something greater than ourselves as we cruise through this great story. So Emmanuel, welcome to the show. And thank you for taking your time out this evening to share with us your wisdom. And thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm so excited that you're here because I think creating a community in a place for fans of something to come together in a meaningful way is so important. But you didn't just start here. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about who you are, what kind of work you've done, kind of like a little bit of your background, so that then when we talk about this, we'll have like a, a foundation. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like that might be the hardest question this entire segment, because I didn't just have, I feel like I've lived five or more lifetimes in my life, you know, and I'm, I'm only 33 and it, it just, it blows my mind. But long story short, I went from being homeless, living in my car to becoming a renowned uh, personal trainer here in Washington, DC, becoming one of the top fitness experts and training a lot of celebrities. And I ended up creating a body sculpting studio and so um, after, you know, about nine years of owning my body sculpting studio, it came to a halt. I decided to create a, a marketing agency or consulting agency that helps out business owners, gym owners, personal trainers, and just teaching them what I did and showing them how to be able to scale to the levels that I did. And then I ended up meeting Yano Naya you know, who's my best friend now, but he was a, a client of mine. He was a gym owner. And, you know, after finding out, you know, six months into our friendship that he's Grover Dill from the movie and I'm a fan, um, we decided to create a, a Christmas story family. And so, um, you know, that's the short version of, of who I am. And so some of the things that I've done is Know, per personal training, body sculpting. You know, I, I do health consulting for a doctor now, and I'm also working with some other celebrities, um, teaching them how to build a community and put things together. So right right now, I own about three businesses, and so <laughs> they they all run on autopilot. You know, while I get to work on different things that helps me reinvest back into myself, you know, educational wise, because ultimately I want to be able to build a legacy that continues to, you know, give back long after I'm gone. Oh, you are, I'm getting goosebumps. You're speaking my language all over the place. So what got you started in bodybuilding or, you know, personal training and the body sculpting? And, and, and I'd love to know how body sculpting is different. I think I know, but I'd love to know yeah. like how you niche that. But what got you started in that? Yeah, so, um, you know, the crazy thing was as a kid, I was always the fastest. I was always working out and I was crazy ripped. Then I was young, 19, a little foolish, ended up having kids. <laughs> so my whole lifestyle changed and um, I became a pig. <laughs> I just came, I, I, would, I would eat whatever, you know, I, I fell in love with like strawberry cheesecake and I would shove it down my throat, a whole pie and like every day, you know, it was just my, it was bad. And I ended up becoming morbidly obese. And, you know, I started going through a, a terrible, terrible marriage. It just started falling apart. We were broke. And um, I went and applied for the Air Force. It was um, the Air Force Reserve. And I passed the test with flying colors. I think I got a 74. You only need like a 30 or 33 or something to, to get accepted. And they 
measure me. Well, first they, they're like, well, pick whatever job you want. And I'm, you know, they give you that hoorah. And I'm like, yes, I'm going to fight for my country. I'm going to die for my country. And then I picked the job that I want. It was tactical air apprentice. You get to jump out of a plane. And he's like, all right, well, let's get you measured for map. So he measures me and he goes, you're too fat. And I said, well, well, well uh, what is boot camp for? And he's like, well, um, for this job, you have to already be fit, but you can pick another job. So we go back to the table and we're looking at the different jobs. And the only one that he had was like shoveling coal or something. It was, it was something that I didn't want to do. Like you already gave me that hoorah. Right. Figure the job. I get to <laughs> parachute. I'm terrified of heights, but you're going to force me to jump out. I want to face my fears. And so I said, no, I, I, I need that job. So he says, okay, I'll give you 30 days. You got 30 days. If you can meet the minimum requirement, we'll go ahead and schedule you. So I went, started working out. I hated it. Um, I could barely, you know, most people walk on a five speed on a treadmill. Mm -hmm. On a five speed on a treadmill, I was cursing people out. I felt like I was going to fly off, right? right? And I started, uh, you know, working out. 30 days later, lost 20 pounds, barely met the minimum requirements. He's like, all right, we'll go ahead and schedule you for MEPS. And I said, nah, I want to be a personal trainer. But I was still fat and I didn't believe it. My family didn't believe it. My kids used to call me fluffy. And so I didn't, I used to joke around wanting to be a personal trainer and kind of in my heart, I wanted it, but I didn't really believe it. And so um, I did it though. I, I decided that I was going to go ahead and leave there. I started walking to every gym. What do I need to do to become a personal trainer? Oh, you got to get certified. You need this. You need that. I didn't have any of those things. I couldn't afford to do it. And I was running out of time. So I ended up leaving to Maryland. Um, I, we were in, in North Carolina at that time. Mm -hmm. I ended up leaving to Maryland to work for this film company who was doing a TV series for uh, HBO. And the long story short with that one is nobody got paid. I was out here on a whim, thought I was going to make all of this money, ended up homeless, living out of my car, still working out, still trying to lose everything. And so I went to my sister's house <laughs> to get, have a place to sleep for a couple of nights. And I started looking up where am I going to, you know, where can I do what I'm most passionate about? And that's training people, teaching them what I did. Cause I ended up losing about 60 pounds in 90 days. And so, um, I found a boot camp company that was hiring. He's, you know, small timer outdoor boot camps, and he has me come try out and he likes me. He's like, all right, you want the job? I'm like, yeah, but I'm not certified. He's like, no worries. I'll help you get certified. And he brings me on and I started teaching. Uh, and so um, started teaching boot camps and maybe like two or three months in, he was ready to fire me. He's like, hey, um, we need to have a serious talk. What's going on? The thing was, Diane, that um, I was canceling classes. I was only making like $25 a day three days a week, you know? So it's like $75 a week. It's not real money. And I started canceling because I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed to show up to work. I was sweaty. I went a week without eating. Um, you know, I had nowhere to, to, to wash my clothes or I was dehydrated. It was like August. I'm sweaty in my car. And the crazy part about my car was um, when you step on the brake, the whole car starts shaking like a clown car. And so I tell him I'm homeless and he's like, Hey, why didn't you tell me, man? I got a basement. Why don't you just come stay in my basement for a week until you get on your feet? And then, um, we be, we ended up becoming best friends. I ended up staying there. Um, and so I'm still not a personal trainer. I'm just a little outdoor boot camp instructor. That was around, um, so around winter time, that was around August, around winter time, it was January the following year, somebody hits me, hits my car, mm. totals it, 
And so now I have no way to get to work. He's like, hey, man, you got to go get you a real job. I can't support you. You know, you're already having tough times here. Um, you got to get a real job. So I said, okay, I'm going to apply for the Sports Club LA. And the Sports Club LA at the time was uh, one of the most exclusive clubs in the country. Um, Equinox ended up buying all of them out. And they were very selective as to whom they bring on board. I think they, like, interviewed 35 people. I was one of those 35 people, yeah. And what they look for is, like, five years of experience and you have to have a degree and on top of that you have to have national academy of sports medicine certification had none of those i'm just this homeless guy teaching boot camps outdoors he's like hey man i i tried applying there three times and they never hired me just go somewhere else start small start like you know goes gym work your way up and i'm like no that's the place i want to be that's where i'm going i'm gonna go get it I go and I apply, make it to the second interview. I still don't have my certification. So <laughs> I start interviewing them and making them take me on a tour through the whole <laughs> club. Mm -hmm. And so we're going through the whole tour. And um, I just like that, that's the day before my second interview, I had just got the letter that I passed the test. So I didn't quite have my certification, but I passed. So I had that little letter to show them. So they called me two days later. There's a third interview. Mm -hmm. They called me two days later and they said, oh, well, you're not selected. I'm like, Damn it. So the crazy part was a couple of days before that, what I ended up doing was um, <laughs> I ended up sending them my um my w-2s my my w-9 all of the paperwork that i needed to do once i got hired and i asked them what time should i be there on monday to start working and it was just it was a couple of days before they called me and turned me down two days later the manager that interviewed me the first time calls me back and says you know what we change our mind. I don't know what it is about you, but there's something about you and I want to give you that chance. So why don't you go ahead and come in and we're going to hire you. So that's how I ended up becoming a personal trainer. And, <laughs> and I ended up getting the job with no experience. Um, it, to give you perspective, the type of level of trainers that were in that club, one of them was a, a famous football player. Uh, Abdul Kareem Al-Jabbar and the same as the basketball player. And, and in fact, they had a little lawsuit. It was crazy. But, um, you know, he was a famous football player for the Miami Dolphins. And he was one of the trainers there out of 47 trainers in that entire place. is a 100,000 square foot gym. It's where all the celebrities went. And so, um, so I was there trying to compete with them and trying to get on their level. And within three months there, they picked me or nominated me as one of the top 10 trainers out of all of those 47 trainers. You know, nice I went from yeah. not ever walking the floor or ever working in a gym. I didn't even know how to use the equipment. I will go walk a, my first client to the equipment. And I'm reading the instructions as we're walking. <laughs> and so <laughs> I had no clue what I was doing. Um, and within three months, I was packed out. People had to go on a waiting list to work with me. It was crazy. Um, and then, you know, within a year of that, I got, I was picked as, or named best personal trainer of Washington, D.C., um, which takes a lot of people <laughs> to, to, to vote for me. And I don't know how it happened, but by the grace of God, it happened. And the next thing you know, I'm training Miss DC from Miss America, Miss USA, Miss International. I ended up getting fired from the place. And I was scared because I built my whole new lifestyle. I had a, I went in, uh, so real quick, just to back up, when I left to come here, I had to leave my children. And I promised them that I was going to um, come back for them. You know, when I, I gave my one little last shot, to you know, my ex-wife and kind of dropped on my knees and started begging her to make things work. And she looked down at me and she said, you ain't shit, 
and you ain't never going to be shit. And I broke down crying. And so I didn't tell her I was going to leave. I just up and left. But I prepped the kids for about two weeks and I told them I was going to leave. I'm going to come back. The whole time I told them I was Iron Man and I was out saving the world. I actually photoshopped a picture of me and sent it over to them. And so, so anyways, um, I was able to, when I got that job, get them get full custody of them. They came live with me. We ended up getting a nice little luxury apartment. And so I got fired and I'm, I'm scared now. It's like, oh my God, w- what's going to happen? And that was right before they, they nominated me as best personal trainer in Washington, D.C. And I'm in the newspaper and stuff. And then I ended up winning. And that just took care of itself and my business took off. And yeah. And so, um, so anyways, through all of those years, I ended up learning how to better craft my what, what I was great at, you know, because a personal trainer is simply this. Someone who learns and understands biomechanics, proper form, right? Teaching you how to properly work out, keep track of your reps and your exercises and come out with the ex- exercise plan. But that's literally what a personal trainer is. Your certification does doesn't teach you anything else. I mean, it teaches you some basics, but not really how to transform somebody's body. But over time, I ended up learning the science behind actual fat loss and body transformation and learning how to do it more for women because one of the pain points that I used to hear all the time is, well, well, women, you know, can't burn fat as fast as men. And it just used to bother me. You know, I grew up with my mom, my two sisters, my grandmother, no male figure. So I grew up around women and it just used to bug me. So I just started trying to figure out how I can do it for women too. And so I learned the real science behind cellular health, fat loss, the way that it works, the whole nine, um, and created a, a fat loss program based on that science to actually transform somebody. So if you wanted a six pack and you were a woman, you came to me for that. And so that's what made me a body transformation expert. Oh, nice. That's great. What an amazing story. How cool is that? I just, I'm so inspired now. I was inspired before. Now I'm really inspired. (laughs) So you know how to build community and it's important to you. And you actually, you obviously had the natural charisma. People kept seeing something in you that connected you to others, even if they couldn't name it. Right. And so um, tell us the story of how you and um, Yano got hooked up and got started on this A Christmas Story family. Yeah. So, you know, I went from like having, renting out little body sculpt and studio, well, renting out gym space and creating my little business within there. Ended up with my own body sculpt and studio and started making like $60,000 a month. Ended up hiring a business coach who damn near drove my business down to the ground. And I was stuck because I didn't have enough money to, um, I didn't have enough money to be able to hire another coach to help me get out of this hole, let alone do marketing and keep my doors open because my rent was $35,000. Well, not, not my rent. My total expenses was $35,000 a month. The rent was $12,000 by itself, a little 2,500 square foot space. So I was stuck trying to figure out these things on my own. And around November of 2018, I started trying to rebrand myself and just taking all of the things that I learned from all of the different business coaches and um, seminars and webinars and trainings that I paid for, just try to utilize it. I had no choice. I had to implement it. And so I ended up recreating my business within 30 days. I think I only slept like 15 days that month. And anyways, I, I ended up digging myself out of a hole, making 60 grand within 45 days. and save myself well when you go to these masterminds and all of these different coaches you end up meeting all of these other business owners and they were all my friends and you know i would call everybody i'm crying i'm trying to figure out my business and they're like there for me but when i figured it out i'm like i figured it out and they're like oh my god what did you do what did you do so i figured out oh snap they're still having the same problems too i can create a a um 
a, a business around it and help other gym owners. At this point, I'm at my wit's end. I'm literally growing gray hairs. I'm so stressed out, you know, even though I'm figuring these things out, like I'm just done, you know, and I used to look at it as my clients being selfish because they were always worried about them and no one ever took the time to actually go, Hey man, what's going on with you? Like, mm-hmm. you know, and so, but I didn't realize it wasn't that they weren't being selfish. It wasn't that at all. They were just so passionate and hooked into my business that, you know, they loved it. But anyways, I just, I didn't see that side. I had no one to coach me, no one to be there for me. And so I said, you know what, my ultimate goal is to impact millions of lives. And if I help gym owners, I can indirectly help impact more people. And so I decided to make a switch, let go of the body sculpting studio, switching to coaching gym owners, teaching them what I did. And Yano was one of those gym owners. And so, um, you know, we, at first, you know, my, my, I had a business partner at the time with, with the company that I was doing this with, and he just didn't, he didn't like Yano. He, for some reason, he just didn't like Yano. Yano wanted to buy um, the first program. He did the sales call, didn't work out. Then Yano wanted to get the second program, the one that I helped create. And he's like, I'm not talking to him. You talk to him. So I get on a call with him and we clicked. You know, a little 30 minute sales call turned into like a two hour sales call and we're just, you know, having a good time. And I'm mm-hmm. like, I'm talking to my partner. I'm like, what is wrong with you? This guy's amazing. You know, and so we just became friends. We started talking, you know, every, um, you know, almost every other day, a couple of times a week. And, you know, five, six months down down the line. Um, I ended up finding from somebody else that Yano acted in a movie. And I'm like, no, no way. So I Google him and Grover Dill from Christmas Story. And I'm like, whoa, hold up. So I call Yano and I'm like, oh, my God, Yano. 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 Who? Why didn't you tell me? He's like, what? Tell me what? I'm like, I, I said some bad words. And I'm like, hey, man. How come you didn't tell me you grow a deal? He, he busts out laughing. He's like, "Yeah, I don't, I, I don't, you know, that's not me. I don't really tell people that I'm grow a deal from the movie." So I start geeking out, and I'm like, "Oh my god, I used to be a fan, and you know, I, I, I love that movie. I've grown up watching it. Like, we got to do something because you know, it's, it's amazing that there's no community out there. There's not, there isn't a platform for us to be able to engage with you, let alone." any movie out there where is there a community where you could just start engaging with the actors and share your memories and and your love for the movie right and there isn't one and so um and also too yano would tell me little stories things that you wouldn't know right the little hidden gems the little secrets so we ended up creating a, a christmas story family which is a free facebook group where we can go ahead and um engage get the cast back together and engage um with with the fans oh i love it i'm actually on in that group already with the moment oh, I, heard yeah. about it, <laughs> I um i got in the group and i love the interaction of not only the fans with each other but with the cast and just all the different things about it and yeah. so um i'm trying to think how to ask a question so you're not one of the cast members I'm not. and you're not one of those people that has all of that other piece of it, but yet you have this like real love for the mission, the family, the movie. Yeah. And so what about a Christmas story touched you to the point where you want to be, and you are the co-founder of a Christmas story family. Cause it's yeah. not like you were one of the kids acting. There's a deeper connection. What was it about the movie that, that yeah, you uh, know. touched you? That's a great question. You know, the the thing about me is that my mom did her best when we were a kid, for sure. But we didn't have everything when I was a kid. You know, we didn't, we definitely didn't grow up poor, poor. You know, my mom bust her butt. She was a paramedic um, and she ended up getting injured and having to do other things. And she did her very best, but she was a single mother. And it was a struggle for her. And so 
we didn't have um, those type of Christmases. Um, and I didn't have a mother and a father. I had my mom, I had my grandmother, I had my sisters, um, but I was that little boy <laughs> walking around in my mom's high heels playing dolls with my sisters. You know, I was that little boy. And so um, watching that movie, you, I, for me, I get to imagine myself having those moments, having the opportunity, you know, right. the, the, the part that other people, you know, don't really get to, to see like myself, you know, I didn't right. have a dad that can s- sneak me a little rifle. And I used to love that rifle. I used to want a rifle though. Like I always wanted that. I remember I used to want to be um, in a, I, I love the movie Top Gun, so I used to want to fly jets. And so all of those little things um, kind of came together for me. So um, I bonded with the movie because I got to snap myself out of my world and inject myself into that movie. And for one moment, you know, one hour, I got to feel like I was in it. No. Oh, that's beautiful. And here you are, a young boy, and that ability to be able to, to get that kind of relief in a way and that inspiration too has a lasting imprint and a lasting impact, yeah. obviously, or you wouldn't be involved in this um, venture of the Christmas Story cool. family, which I think is fun that everybody's considered a family. Yeah, yeah. You know? And that's exactly how we we want to treat it. You know, you're yes, you're a fan. Yes, they're the actors. But at the end of the day, we're still family. We're still human. You know, and just the other day, there was a little drama in the family. And they they were going back and forth. And I said, man, this is beautiful. This right here lets you know that we're family. Because the fact that you guys are taking the time to go back and forth, that means that you're passionate, you care. Because if you didn't care, you just walk away. It doesn't matter. You're only going to argue with somebody that, that you really love and you're, you're passionate about. And so um, it's, it's just crazy because, you know, now me looking at it, being able to talk to Zach and the other actors and hang out with Piano, it's crazy But because it went from being on TV into my living room, into my house. Mm-hmm. Like I am, I was able to bring the cast together and get them to engage with the fans you know um and it's just it 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 blows me away it's it's still surreal so the energy you have that people are so attracted to is the fact that you're like an alchemist or a chemist or a catalyst right you just bring the ideas together and then something beautiful happens with body sculpting with the personal training with the boot camp thing and it's like oh i can see this like a visionary i can see this and so how can i transform what's here and make it something that's even more magical and more beautiful for sure yeah yeah that's a really beautiful talent and skill and i'm glad you bring it to the table that's a really thank you so what kinds of things do you do for your own stress relief and taking care of you yeah so um a few different things and you know i've tried a lot of different things over over the years um but currently what i do is um meditation is one um listening to audio that um i i'm not all too too well versed in the science behind it but like you know, playing around with the brain waves so that way everything can, you know, balance out and, and having the anchor so that you can snap out of it. Um, working out for sure. Um, that over the past year has definitely been, you know, it, I've had struggles with it. Uh, <laughs> especially, I'm not going to lie, since I let go of my body sculpting studio, it hasn't been the way when I had my body, sc- body sculpting sure. studio. I lived in it, right? Um, but Um, you know, working out for sure. Um, and doing the meditation, although most of the time I try to, I hate wanting or the idea of doing it, especially when I'm stressed out, but I know it's something that works for people that, you know, are really successful. And so I try to model success as much as I can, but after I do it, 
I'm happy. I'm glad that I did. Otherwise, I would stay in my funk for days, sometimes even a week. And it's so hard to get out of it and you lose so much energy. But when you're able to find these little things where, um, you know, you can escape that stress, even for just five, 15 minutes, it it changes you. It changes right. your whole day and the amount of stuff that you can complete. And the other thing that I like to do is brain dump because um, my brain, for some reason, I could pull three all-nighters right now. If I don't shut off my brain, I will be up for three days straight and I won't be able to stop. You can't say I know this. I will not be able to stop until I get it out of my head and create it. And I can't just write it down. I have to create it. So before my ideas build up in my head to where I have to create it, I have to do brain dump. And so I'll just write down all of the ideas. And if I do that, I feel like I can forget it. It's, it's safe. It's okay for me to forget it and walk away from it. Then I could turn it into a to-do list. And if I have that, then it's crazy because I can execute and just knock out so much. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. That whole idea of your brain getting filled in the visions and stuff, that's called an intellectual overexcitability that only gifted people oh, have. Oh, really? And um, it's a what? sign of giftedness. I, I'm in, internationally known in that arena. And I work with gifted visionaries, all, mostly all um, professional, either actors, musicians, athletes, because they're visionaries. So it total makes sense to me that that is what you would be doing, that that's the thing you have. And so you have found a really great way to handle it. That's what I always tell people. Write it all down, because now you know it's safe, and then we can orchestrate from there. Oh, wow. Yeah, I didn't know any of that. That's, that's, well, that's why I'm sharing it with you because I'm like, <laughs> you, you found it because you're open and you're willing and you've learned a lot of things and you go after trying to apply them. And so you might not have had the language, but you had the solution. Nice. You know, awesome. that's really cool. That's very exciting. So where do you see a Christmas story family going? It's now this group on Facebook. And I know that you and Yano probably have some kind of vision for some exciting things is there anything that you're at liberty to say kind of things yeah. could be coming down the pike or neat ideas you have you know for oh, those yeah. of us like me who are like what's gonna happen next what's gonna oh, happen yeah. next yeah see now my hairs are standing up on the back of my neck and <laughs> i can feel those shivers because we've got a lot coming down the pipeline we were i mean we literally just we launched it last year, yes, but we did an official launch, like we're going all in just 30 days ago, and it exploded. And so our goal, our mission is to be able to find all of the fans, all of the Christmas Story fans, millions of them, and be able to give them this, this same platform where they can not just interact with the cast, but get things that are from them. Because yes, you know, the house is, it's good, but it's a prop. You know, the lamp, it's good, but it's a prop. You can't interact with that. You can't engage with it. And so we want to create long lasting memories and new memories. And one of the ways that we're going to create that is by creating a TV series. And yes, so we're going to bring the cast back out. We're going to create a new series. Um, I'm not going to go too much into it, but it's a new series. And we, we're already working with uh, a few different people who's going to help us create, uh, create this and, and make it a reality. But our, our goal and our mission is by this time next year, everybody will be able to sit down in front of their um, 24-hour marathon and not just watch a Christmas story movie, but be able to engage with the cast now in a new TV series. Oh, that gives me goosebumps. That's really exciting. And, and I love that there is a vision beyond just typing on Facebook. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there is a vision for it. And, and when people come together with a common purpose or a common thing, a common love, no matter what it is, mm -hmm then that builds a sense of community. And we need that so much in the world sure. is people to feel connected to other people yeah. you know, on a common, on a common yeah. ground. I have a, a community for someone gets me for this podcast. That is a community for gifted visionary people. That's just a safe place for them to be, to just be heard and understood yeah. and talk to each other and have a place. And I think we all need to have a place. Oh yeah, for sure. And, 
and nothing more fun than have a place around something so beautiful as a Christmas story, the movie, but the whole idea of Christmas and the whole idea of unconditional love and care and excitement and fun, yeah. you know, like yeah. all of that neat stuff. Oh, yeah, you want to know what you want to know what's really crazy too is that our idea behind this TV series is that we want to make it as interactive as possible. And so the TV series is one series, but it's broken down into um, three segments. So I don't know if you ever watched The Walking Dead. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with The Walking Dead, as soon as you're done watching The Walking Dead, they have uh, another show called The Talking Dead, where you can sit there and people can ask questions and they're talking about what happened on the show. But at the same time, they have another show going on um, called, I think, Fear the Walking Dead, right? And so it's in a different different city, different place, different town. So similar concept, but a little bit more engaging. So we're going to do some where we actually bring the fans into the TV shows, the TV episodes. We're going to allow the fans to help us also create some of these episodes. So, um, you know, when's the last time you had to have some impact on what the show should be about or what would you like to see in there, right? Um, And so we're going to create it kind of like those books where you can choose your own path, you know? And Mm -hmm. and so, yeah, we, we want everybody to be engaged with this because now you're not just a part of allowing the movie to be a memory of you, you're helping create that memory, not just for yourself, but for many generations to come. Right. And, and all the others who are part of it and everybody wins. It's like a win, yeah. win, 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 win everywhere. Sure. Oh, oh, that's really amazing. I have a couple more questions that are a little bit off a of Christmas story family, but, and they're a little bit more personal. So, um, I, cause I like people to really know who we're talking to. And one of them is in all of your world and all of the travels you've done and everything, what's the most memorable food you've ever eaten? Memorable in a good way or in a bad way? However you want to answer it. So I haven't been able to travel that much. And so I'm trying to think of something that was memorable in a good way because I love trying new different things. I'll give you a story of one that (laughs) was memorable in a bad way. Okay. All right. Um, and that was actually here in Washington, D.C. There's a, a restaurant called Diplomat. It's an amazing restaurant, by the way. Um, amazing restaurant, amazing experience. And there was this, I'm on a date. <laughs> There's this uh, $150 platter. And so um, this, this um, seafood platter, it's like this big old tower. And they have all of these different type of um, seafood that you can eat. And I just want to do something weird and different. You know, we had some snails, we had some whatever else that was, some of it was French names. So I, I can't remember the names, but you know, just exotic food. Right. And there was, the snails were okay, but there was this one fat little slug and the mouth was, was open. It was just stuck like the and oh we both looked at each other and we're like, and I'm like, $150, girl, you can't, we got to have to eat this. And so the good thing is we were drinking a lot. So we were a little tipsy. So anyways, I put it in my mouth and we both instantly are like, oh, no, no. Oh, man. It tasted like crap. It was horrible. It was the most horrible thing I ever put in my mouth. I don't know why I did it, but oh, it was <laughs> horrible. Yeah. So Whoa. that was that was just I don't even know what it was. It looked like a slug and it had a big old mouth and it was just staring at me. It was it was nasty. Oh my word. Oh my word. Okay. Is there anything that you wanted to share about a Christmas story family that I didn't ask you about or that's coming to mind that you would like everyone to know? Yeah, so I wanted to do something crazy and weird and amazing that nobody has done before with the cast because they've always done, you know, um, they'll, they'll come to those events and people get signing and there's the traditional a Christmas story stuff that you see, right? Um, and 
I wanted to have something, give something special to people that um, nobody else has, and that hasn't been created yet. So it took a lot of thinking. It took us about a year to come up with this, but I think it's genius. Um, I asked Yano to go through, because he told me one time in a conversation, just a random conversation, that his mom was taking pictures. You know, she's the proud mom taking pictures. Well, you know, we didn't have, they didn't have phones back then. I wasn't even born, but, you know, they, they would take the picture and slide it and whatever. And so um, she took all of these pictures and I said, hey, you still got those pictures? And he's like, I don't know. Let me go look. So he found these pictures. He found these really cool pictures behind the scene that his mom took. His mom took. Like the people that filmed it don't even have these pictures. Time Warner doesn't even have these pictures. Or Warner Brothers, whoever owns the movie, don't even have these pictures. And um, he he found the little three by five. Remember when you get those printed out? Yeah. yeah. And so um, he has the little three by five, and we found one of him in the trash can. And there's something about the trash can. I'm not going to tell you, but there's a secret about the trash can that nobody knows. I didn't even know just up until last week when he found the pictures. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. And so we're going to reveal that soon, but um, that picture, and then there's um, another picture of him wrestling around with Ralphie in between scenes. They were just playing around outside. And it's a really cool picture of him and Ralphie wrestling. And so um, I said, you know, how cool would it be if we duplicate those same pictures, the same three by five, and you autograph them? And, but not only just autograph it, but why don't we just give it away? Just give it away for free. Just give it to the fans. We pick a certain amount because of course he can't sit there and sign his hand away for forever. Right. Um, But uh, we pick, you know, a thousand people and we sign it away and that's it. Only a thousand people ever will have access to these uh, pictures. And it might not even be a thousand. I'm trying to get them to do a thousand, but um. Yeah, it'll, it'll just be a limited edition, pictures behind the scenes that nobody else has autographed by Grover Dill himself. Wow, that's cool. That's exciting, too. And I love it that they were pictures his mom took. And so they weren't like official behind the yep. scenes. It was behind the scenes <laughs> <laughs> from the mom's point of view, which yes. has a whole different lens than oh, for sure. other people. You know what I mean? So that's really cool. Proud so, mom. Yeah, That'll be really, really exciting. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay, so your last question of the day is, because I've held you so long. Thank you for being so patient. I just have all these great questions. If um, we were going to put a billboard up on on the road that the whole world was going to see, everybody's going to see this billboard with your quote on it, what would that quote be? Hmm. So... There's a lot of quotes, and I don't want to take credit for any of them because I don't know that I created it. But um, can I give you two? Sure. All right. So one quote that I used to hear all the time, and you know, grown-ups used to always tell me this, and I just never got it. But then one day I did, <laughs> and that's eat one, teach one. And I feel like people need to take that with heart but like really mean it and teach somebody out of love out of care out of compassion because it brings all of these things out of birth yes. when i when i approach Yano with this it, it wasn't out of hey we can make a lot of money out of this it was purely out of love wanting to put this together and it opened up so many doors and i wish i could go down that route because there's some crazy things that happen. Another celebrity who I freaking love and adore and watch all the time is now also in my living room. And I'm now going to be working with them to do these things. It's just crazy. But it all happened because of through the Christmas Story family, right? Mm -hmm. And it came out of passion. It wasn't out of, hey, yes, you should get paid what you're great for. But also too, when you see an opportunity to help someone, just genuinely help them. Yeah. And and when when I approach this next guy with the same given hand, he's been he's been burned so many times in that world um, that he was scared to take my offer. 
Um, and the good thing is, is that I came from referrals of people that I've actually helped. And so he's a little more open, but he, even then he was still hesitant. Um, but I'm there to help him. Right. Um, and so I, I feel like if the world can do more of that, that small little quote, each one teach one is a great one, mm -hmm. but one that is near and dear to my heart. And it's what gets me to wake up every day and fight, even though I don't want to or I'm burnt out, or I feel like no one cares, or no one can hear me, or I'm not screaming loud enough, or I'm not at the capacity that I feel like I'm supposed to be, that other people are simply by doing nothing, right? What I, my quote would be, I firmly believe that my responsibilities aren't just the five or six people around me. My responsibilities are the eight billion plus people in this world and my goal and my job, my responsibility, my moral obligation is to create a legacy that is going to continue to give back long after I'm gone. Mm, that's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. Wow. Well, everybody, you've been listening to Emmanuel Soba and his wisdom and his story. It, and, oh, it's so great to meet you and, and share your ideas, your inspiration, your vision all of you, you know, all of these neat parts of you um, with everybody. So I want to thank you for taking the time for being on the show and, and sharing so freely. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. So remember everybody, the link to A Christmas Story Family um, is in the show notes. So you can go there right now if you haven't already on one of the other episodes and get in that group with me and everybody else because we are having fun over there. And, and it's a really great movie and it's really good people coming together to do good in the world. And so don't forget to do that. And when you're messaging in there and you see Emmanuel in there, tell him you heard him on the show, right? Okay, so remember this, everybody. Keep your face to the sun so the shadows fall behind you because you're a rock star and you're here on purpose with a purpose. So go out there, let your light shine, be that lighthouse for someone else. And until the next episode of Someone Gets Me, be well.